Have you tried Anchor FM yet? What are you waiting for? Anchor is the only platform that includes all the tools that you need to launch your podcast instantly, including monetization. That's right. Start making money right now. Record, edit, distribute, and earn all right from your Anchor FM dashboard. It's time to set sail on that podcast that you've been dreaming of making. Just don't forget your Anchor. Anchor FM, the easiest way to make a podcast ever. There's a speed limit in this state, Mr. Neff. 45 miles an hour. How fast was I going, officer? I'd say around 90. But what about us? Memories. You're talking about memories. Good, now have a drink. I don't want anything of his or any part of it. Except his life. I wonder if I know what you mean. I wonder if you want to. Play it for her, you can play it for me. I lived a few weeks while she loved me. Waiting for a lady. Someday you'll understand that. Got some news that's going to take a lot of attention off you and Laura. Stop it, yes, I can't take any more of it. I should be in the corner. You know, the story? What story? Maybe because he was drunk. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. Well, I'll give you the message. I never sleep all over America. Welcome to the Speakeasy Noir cast a podcast discussing film noirs of yesterday and neo-noirs of today. Each week, we will deliver a discussion and analysis of classic and neo-noir films, all mixed in with our unintelligible banter. Your hosts for the show, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. Hey, Carly, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm I'm okay, I guess. <laughs> That was so woeful. I'm okay, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to give you as long as a delay as you give me when you respond. Oh, dramatic so I was pause. Dr- dramatic pauses for our audience at home who are listening to this on the radio who do not want dramatic pauses. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, been a while since we talked, huh? Mm. Whole week. Well, you're you're full of life this morning, uh, this <laughs> afternoon, this evening. When are we doing this? Is it nighttime? Where? What time is it where you're at? It's afternoon, right? It's, yeah, four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock. How's it going over in the UK? Is Boris still acting crazy? He's always crazy. Um, mm. My husband said, like, there's going to be a curfew or something coming in, apparently. You know, I said that we could have, everyone can go to the pubs again. Mm-hmm. Apparently, there's going to be yeah. a curfew where you can go to the pub, but only till like ten o'clock. I don't know Why? if COVID like clocks off at ten o'clock. Yeah, right. That seems weird. <laughs> it's had its fill for the day, and it's like, oh, I'm done. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't. There's loads of like um, random things that come through the newspapers, though, that like are either half true or 100 percent accurate. So I'm guessing that there's something that they're discussing, but whether it's a curfew. I don't really know because I don't know how that would help, but I'm not in the know. So that's why I'm not in politics because I don't know. (laughs) I think you would know if you were in politics. I think it's the other way around. I wouldn't Um, be able to keep my mouth shut if I knew. Straight straight away, if I got any sort of position of power, I'd be like, Roswell, tell me about that. Get me every file. I want to know. I want to know the truth. (laughs) And then I'd just tell everyone. I'd phone you. I'd be like, guess what? (laughs) I mean, that's probably the way all politics are. Politicians are anyway. I mean... They can't keep their mouth shut and everybody wants to know about Roswell, <laughs> <laughs> which, you know, is probably just some broom closet, you know, in the middle of the desert somewhere that just houses like storage bins of crap. <laughs> the FBI fingerprints. It's just, no, no, not even FBI. Just <laughs> scrap metal they found that people have said were from flying saucers. Like, oh, I don't know where we're going to put those. Yeah. How about that, uh, that 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 facility over in Roswell where we throw all our junk? <laughs> With a little post-it note, found by Margaret. <laughs> right. <laughs> on a drive. <laughs> 1923 piece of metal found on the beach by Margaret. <laughs> <laughs>
I've had an exciting morning rewatching the Avengers film. The Avengers. Okay, like the original, the first one? Um, kind of like all of them. Okay. But you don't think they're real films, so that makes you mad. <laughs> well, that's not true. That's not true. I particularly like the first film. I thought it's pretty good. Um, and then I watched, did you, have you ever heard of, um, oh, what's it called? Let me get this right. What They Do in the Shadows. Yeah, that, that sort of mockumentary thing. Yes, I watched that as well. Because I, I was in my Marvel loop and then I ended up on Ragnarok and then I did like some weird internet movie database spiral. And I ended up watching that and it was really good. really liked it. I wish I was a vampire. Yeah, I thought it was interesting idea. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I, I personally particularly cared for it. You have no soul. No, it's not that I think it's bad though. That's different. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't, <sighs> I don't know how to say it. <laughs> like, you don't want to say you don't like it. You just don't know how to say you don't like it without saying you don't like it. <laughs> no, it's not that I really, it's not even that I don't like it. It's just that it's just not one of those types of movies that are for me. Like, I don't, I'm not particularly, I don't know. I, it was funny, but I just found it stupid. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was, I was ticking. It was ticking all my boxes when the vampires were going dating. That was brilliant. And then it turned out that they were just trying to pick up someone to eat. <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't know. <laughs> it was okay, I guess. And the, I haven't watched the TV show at all. You know, there's a TV show, right? Yeah, I saw that. I haven't watched that yet, but I mean, hey, you liked it, so I did is that? I did. I have new, I have a new bunch of new favorite people to crazy internet movie database stalk. So. but uh in regards to avengers i do think that the first movie is really well done that that movie surprised me but then again it might have just been because it's one of the earlier marvel films um you know and we weren't so so inundated with so many superhero movies which again i am one of the ones that are guilty of being a hypocrite regarding the superhero films because when i was younger this is exactly what I wished for. You willed it into existence and now you don't like yeah, it. Yeah, definitely part of that collective like willing into existence of superhero movies. Um, but now there's just too many. It's like everything is a superhero movie and it's just really tough um, to to not have more of a palette of films. You know, we need we need more stuff out there. We need we need more like small thriller films, you know. And they just don't do well these days, and I don't know why. I don't know what why about are... a small thriller film about a superhero? Boom, gone mass market. You are that sort of thing could work. I mean, as we've seen with like the the new Joker movie that came out. I mean that that idea does work. The problem with it is though is that when you associate it with a a character that's already been around in existence for so long, you can't help but you know think of those other versions and let's face it there's a lot of versions of the joker that are pretty cheesy or silly or or you know played in such a different way that you just can't escape that that past of that character as to where if you see a movie like uh sam raimi did in you know the early 90s of um dark man for instance like nobody you know knows what dark man was until that movie comes out and then you know, it was pretty amazing. So that it, that definitely works. The whole idea definitely works. But I wish that they, they could just come up with a new character. It doesn't necessarily have to be based on a comic. But, of course, Hollywood and the money machine, you have to have a previous property attached to it because that's how they think you get people in the theater, which they're not wrong. And I solely, you know, chalk that up to the audience. It's the audience's fault that we have that because that's what people go and see. You know, but I can't do anything about that other than not go and see them myself but you could chat with them outside the cinema i don't want to do that no i don't want to i'm not <laughs> you know i'm not a yeller <laughs> it takes a certain kind of person yeah i mean i only waited in line once for a marvel movie not by choice but um and i can't remember what it was uh but took the kids to go see it. everybody wanted to go see it um i made street watch a midnight show in of um captain america civil war yeah, I didn't really in, care for that one either. In the freezing cold, he said it was a dead nice place to go sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now, Carly, why do you like these films? You, you weren't a comic book reader, were you? Um, No, I'm one of them annoying people that doesn't really, like, pay that much attention to comic books that in depth, but kind of enjoys specific characters. Like, I'm nutty about Superman. I love Superman. I love all the films. 
I don't particularly care whether it's the same as the comic or not. I just like Superman. And the same with Captain America. Listen, I don't want to hear that you only like these movies because you think that the lead actor is hot. Okay, that's that's going to annoy the shit out of me. Um, so if you want to annoy me, go that route. Would I ever say anything like that? Yeah, uh, Guy Pierce. Well, he's not a superhero, is he? He's a villain. We could go off a list. <laughs> but um, like, I want to hear like a real like... I like this movie because of that, like a real critique of it. You know what I mean? Like we got enough of those, uh, that, that sort of vapid shallowness in the world here. So Carly did dig deep into your coffers here and explain to me why you like Superman and what is your favorite Superman movie? I like Superman because he's just, he's just like a little beacon of like hope and joy and just like a little boy scout. that's like, Oh, we fix it all. But weirdly enough, I quite like Man of Steel because it's so different to all the other Superman films and it's so dark and like menacing and like Superman like snaps someone's neck for God's sake. (laughs) But that's not, which is weird. I appreciate the filming and the idea probably more and like making Superman not a beacon of joy and hope. And they make him so dark in that. But I kind of. So your favorite Superman movie is like the antithesis of why you like Superman? I said I quite liked Man of Steel. I don't really want to say what my favorite incarnation of Superman is because you'll laugh at me. Why? <laughs> no, no, I, I genuinely want to know. Like, what's your favorite one? That's fine. If it's Man of Steel, fine. It's not I haven't seen it. So it's I don't not know. a film. It's not a film. That's fine. It, Cartoon? That's fine. No, it is. <laughs> you know when, um, oh, what's it called? The it, Superman it was like theory. Superman porno or something? I mean, where was going with this? <laughs> I mean... If anyone from DC is listening, I want to know. Thing. Um, no, the one with Terry Hatcher, where she was Lois Lane, and Dean Cain was Superman. And oh yeah, the that's a great show. Superman was it? The Adventures of Superman. Yeah. I really like that because it's just so fun, and Lex Luthor is just so annoyingly not evil. He's just he's a pain in the ass. That's all he is. But it's still like all neatly wrapped up at the end, and then we're off next week for another adventure. She's got herself in a window. She's not meant to go. Totally think that's a good film. I mean, a good TV show. Yeah, it's, that's that's. I mean, that's respectable. What's wrong with that? I thought you were gonna laugh at me. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's like the one thing Dean Cain had that was great. I mean, yeah, it was fine, especially for the time that it came out. It wasn't, you know, it did well. It was good. Terry Hatcher was great in it too. Ooh. Um, it was a fun show. Yeah, I really liked it. It was loosely. Yeah, I'm I'm really partial to the uh, Christopher Reeve stuff. Um. I, I like those films, even the bad ones. I, I enjoy those quite a bit. So I never really got into, I, I don't think that anybody has really, I think he was really the the greatest Superman on screen. Like, I think he was able to pull off the the goofiness and, and the, you know, the strong, you know, Superman type character in one as to where I don't think any, like, what's his name? Harry Cavehill? Mm. Like I, that's just he just can't do that. He's too much of like the the good looking leading man guy that I just don't think he can play that Clark Kent version. And that stuff like really bothers me. I, I just you know I mean if you're gonna do that character, yeah, um, yeah, and then, yeah. As to where like Dean Kane I think was able to find a good middle ground because he's not really that goofy kind of guy either. But um, I think he really found his stride with that as well. Um, so I, I do I do respect that version as well. But I think Christopher Reeve is really the best version of it. I mean, he was he could be super goofy and then also very tough and you know um authoritative. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like he really had that sort of manliness to him when he's in the Superman version. Um but at the same time it's like I really respected that whole sort of like goofiness to him, you know, like always you know, dropping things and, you know, messing with his glasses. He did, just did a great job. He's, he was just a really good actor when it came to that to that role. Um, and these more modern versions of him, I just don't like Brandon Roth. And I just don't I don't know. I just I just don't think that they were they were just going for looks. The only the only newer one that I've seen was the um, Superman Batman one, um, which I loathe, loathe. What's his name is Batman? <laughs> oh, Ben Affleck. Yeah. We're not allowed to watch that version because um, the Lex Luthor, I'm sure it's Lex Luthor, starts like beating Superman with kryptonite. And I just, I get so sad. I was pregnant, I think, when I was watching it. And I was just, I was just crying. This was, we tried Madagascar 3. 
and in the first five minutes the lion got shot so that went off I'm not watching this this i'm not about this animal cruelty turn this shit off <laughs> so that went off and street was like oh, i know we'll watch well what you know tried and tested good old let's put superman on fucking starts beating him with bloody cribs and I went off Superman. No, that went off as well. We're not having that. I was getting so upset. I was like, Street, they're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Street was like, I don't know. I don't know how to answer you, you, your question, you crazy hormonal woman. <laughs> <laughs> so that went off as well. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough about Superman. Let's get into our drink for tonight, okay? Because there's nothing about our film tonight that's related to Superman at all, I don't think. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so tonight's drink uh, is called the Hypnotic Breeze. And a Hypnotic Breeze is two ounces of hypnotic liquor, one ounce of coconut rum, a splash of pineapple juice, ice, and you put sugar on the rim of the glass. So it's another sweet drink. Um, I've never had hypnotic liquor before, but what I... is hip? What is that? Is that an actual thing or is that a brand? What the hell? I believe it's a brand, but it's a thing. Like it's their own. Like um, uh, I'm not exactly. Sh- it's a liqueur, but it's like its own thing. Like you know what I mean? It's not like rum or anything like that. It's I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it's like 17 percent alcohol. It's a, it's it's an alcohol. You know what I mean? So there's something um, out there that I could feed to people and hypnotize them and make them do my bidding. <laughs> Possibly. Oh, yeah, and it's cool. Yes. It looks blue, too. Sweet. A nice little, like, blue or <gasps> green. I'm colorblind, so I'm guessing it's either blue or green. Is it Superman <laughs> blue? Maybe they're still yeah. all tying together. No, oh. it's more like seafoam green blue. <laughs> nice. <laughs> From what I can tell, anyways. Again, I'm colorblind, so I could be wrong. I get these things wrong. <laughs> Um, the directions for this drink is you dip the rim in gl- uh, of glass into pineapple juice, or you could use water, and then dip it into the sugar uh, to sugar the rim. Uh, you add hypnotic coconut rum and pineapple juice to a cocktail shaker. Uh, add enough nice, add enough ice to the shaker to cool down the mixture. Put the lid on and shake uh, until well mixed. And the glass, you know, the ice sounds different. Uh, pour through the strainer into your favorite glass. Garnish with whatever you like. Uh, I guess that sounds like maybe, I don't know, what would I put on there? Maybe a pineapple wedge, I guess, or maybe even an orange wedge. Banana leaf? Banana leaf, (laughs) possibly. (laughs) I've seen people are using like a rock sugar, a little uh, like stick of rock sugar they put in it. But um, yeah, so it looks pretty good, though. I'm going to try it. It looks like it's served uh, mostly in a martini glass or a variation of it. Um, so it'd be interesting. Maybe maybe it's a, a vodka base or a gin base or something. I'm not sure. <clears throat> but there you have it. That is the hypnotic breeze. So hopefully you guys uh, you know can find uh, hypnotic liqueur and are able to make this along with us and uh, enjoy our discussion of the movie tonight. And with that, uh, we are going to check out the trailer for the film Fear in the Night. You know how to get here from a dream, didn't you? You knew where the key was from a dream, didn't you? All that fumbling around didn't fool me. You even knew where the light switch was from a dream? If you weren't Lil's brother, I'd push a lion face out to the back of your head. At first, all I could see was this face coming toward me. Then I saw the room. A queer mirrored room. And somehow, I was inside it. There was danger there. 
I knew that. I wanted to turn and run, but I couldn't. It seemed as if my brain was handcuffed. And I had to do what I'd come to do. Vince Grayson just called. He's not feeling well. Will you take his window today? Oh, is Vince sick? What did he say it was? The more I tried to figure it out, the sicker I got. Suddenly, the room started spinning. <laughs> Say, Cliff, I went out to such and such a place in the canyon last night and killed a guy. Such and such a guy for such and such a reason. But I tell you... No, you had to cook up a dream. I can respect a guy no matter how rotten a crime he's committed who will own up to it. I can understand a guy who'll deny it flatly. But a guy that'll come to someone trading on the fact he's married to his sister, abuse his common sense, and make a fool out of him like you did to me. But I didn't... I had to get out of my room. Out into the sunshine. I had to stay out of the shadows. And I knew that tonight... I'd be afraid of the dark. Oh my God! I feel like uh, I feel like I'm in, stuck in uh, Empire Records or something. Uh, what is with today? Today, <laughs> it's Rex Manning Day. That's what it is. So that was the trailer for Fear in the Night, 1947 film. Uh, it's a film noir crime film, um, not labeled as a thriller. <laughs> but it seems like it's a bit of a thriller to me, but I guess it is considered a crime film. Uh, it's directed by Maxwell Shane, and it stars Paul Kelly and DeForest Kelly, uh, who you might know from um, Star Trek. Yeah, he plays Bones in, in the original Star Trek and the Star Trek films. Um, and this is his film debut. Uh, it's based on a uh, Cornell Woolrich uh, story. I'm not sure if it's like a full-fledged book or not. Um, I couldn't find it, but um, the the story is called And So to Death. It seems that he used a pen name for it, which was William Irish instead of his, his real name. So I'd be curious... Um, what that was about. It was also retitled um, from And So to Death, uh, retitled into Nightmare, uh, which ended up being the original title for this film. And the book came out, or the story wherever it was published, came out in 1943. So this film followed, you know, about five years afterwards. The film was also remade by the same director in 1956 with the title Nightmare. And this time it stars one of our favorite actors, Edward G. Robinson, playing the cop. Ah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you knew that, but that was something that I found. That was probably the most interesting information I could find on this movie. <laughs> I, I knew it had been remade, but I didn't know um, anything about the remake. Yeah, I couldn't actually find the remake because I didn't know that they had a different title. Ah. Um, so it was like I, I was coming up with nothing. The closest I could come up with was like a 1970s film, a uh, horror film, a hammer film. So I, just, I you were telling me that and I could not figure out what it was and i finally came across that uh it's called nightmare and uh, this was something that maybe we should put on our list because you know i mean it must be great if edward g robinson's in it or at least semi good <laughs> yeah definitely with a what so carly before we get into this movie um why don't you give us your in a nutshell synopsis and here's your newly i guess dramatic piano piece underscore to your rambling <laughs> And now it's time for Carly's super famous in a nutshell synopsis. All right, let's hear this. Dr. McCoy <laughs> dreams of a murder, then wakes to find that it might actually be real. But we don't really care because he's the nicest character on the planet ever. <laughs> it's true. He's super yeah. nice. He's a great guy. Yeah. 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 I don't care if he killed everybody. He could have stabbed Cliff. I don't care. <laughs> he should have stabbed Cliff. He beat the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> but I did find this movie kind of fascinating. Uh, it This is a strange one to me because I didn't know what the heck was going on until I think the moment that the cop <laughs> finds out, which I, I guess... Uh, I'm terrible with the names. Uh, Cliff, is that the name of the cop? I think so. Yeah, Vince. Vince, I think, is the guy that... Um, that. Yeah, F Vince is DeForest Kelly, and Cliff, I think, is like the brother-in-law cop. Yeah. 
So I didn't actually grasp what was going on until Cliff in this story finds out. And like, he starts to piece together. I'm like, Oh, I know where he's going with this. And, and I've, I really liked that aspect because it really kept me guessing. I'm like, this is so off the wall. Like he, he has this, the movie opens with this dream sequence, which is presented fairly nightmarishly for, you know, like a forties film. They don't show much, but it's, it makes me feel uneasy when I watch it because I'm like, what is going on with this? I thought it was so good. The, like the murder in his eye and stuff is just like, that was so creepy and filmed so well. Yeah. And I, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, oh, this dude's terrible. He's awful. He's like, he's, he's obviously a bad guy. He looks like he's so mean or whatever. And then when you get into the movie, he's such a nice guy. <laughs> it's yeah, like, what's so the, sweet. what is going on? And you don't know because he wakes up from this nightmare after killing somebody, which is very odd. You don't know what's really happening. It's just two people in a room, a woman and a guy, and then he comes in and he just attacks one of them and murders him and shoves him into a closet and then wakes up from his dream. And I believe he's got like blood on him and he's got like a button and a key in his pocket, things that he doesn't recognize. He's got bruises on his neck. There's like all these weird things that he's just like, what what the hell happened? And it's implausible that, you know, unless this is Nightmare on Elm Street, that, you know, these things that happen in his dream could happen in real life. Um, but it's it's throwing him for a loop because he's just like looking at himself in the mirror and just like, what is what is going on? I don't understand. It's like he's completely like – and he only like sort of half remembers the dream and nothing is really coherent. But it's all very strange and odd. And he's such a good guy and doesn't know what to do about it. He goes to his uh, his – Stepbrother is his, it's his stepbrother, right? It's yeah, isn't it? His um, sister's husband, his brother, yeah. like brother-in-law. So his his girlfriend or soon to be wife's uh, sister's husband, right? No, his sister's husband. Oh, oh, she's his sister. Okay, got it. Yeah, okay, and they're pregnant, aren't they? I would, okay, like, well, I must have slightly missed that. I thought it was his girlfriend's sister. It's his sister's husband. Got it. Yes. Okay, that's why they looked so different. <laughs> I swear, sometimes in these movies, the dialogue is so fast and they do so much exposition and dialogue that you could easily just miss something and not un- quite understand it. Um, something as simple as that. <laughs> the relationship of people. I don't know. At least I can. Um, I can. And in my house, it's definitely difficult to find the time to sit down and really pay attention 100%. Um, and, and some of these movies really command that in order to to grasp everything. But, um, so yeah, so she goes to, he goes to a uh, cliff and sort of like, is like, Hey, I, th- you know, think I killed somebody. And he's like, what are you crazy? What are you talking about? They're going off for a picnic. And he, I guess, you know, shows them the way to this house that he sees in his dream. Cliff is just like, how do you know this? How do you know? You know, like, how did we get here? What is going on? Like, he is just, not believing him, but at the same time, like, what is up? Like, there's something crazy happening here. And then you get up into the room and everything is just lining up with this entire story. The the room with mirrors, uh, being able to find the house, the key, everything is just lining up. So they eventually go upstairs um, and he shows them the mirrored room and Cliff opens the door and he sees blood on the wall and things are starting to click for him. Now he's like, oh shit, something did happen. He's not created something, you know, whatever it might be, something's going on. So then they go down the stairs and he just beats the shit out of him. <laughs> I was like, whoa, calm down here. <laughs> He's pretty horrible to him. He makes him pass out like every five minutes. If he wasn't on the, on the radar of the suspect, I mean, he is now, thanks to Cliff. Shows him a picture and he just bleh, bleh, and passes out. <laughs> Right. And then he'll like make him look at some blood or something. He's like, bleh, bleh, passes out. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the Forrest Kelly like did great with this. I think he was he was I good. Did. Yeah, I, I was very sympathetic to him. And like, I mean, it, I think that was great casting. I think initially he was uh, written off on this movie as just being you know not good in it. But it's since you know current reviews and, and current viewers uh, disagree with the initial reviews, which is fairly common in film. Um, but I just thought he was just, I thought he was really good in it. He was very sympathetic and just, um, 
I mean, really feel for the guy because you can just tell he doesn't know what is going on or why he knows this or how any of it happened. And um, I think that was great casting to lead into the plot point, you know. So anyway, he's he's beating this guy up and in walks a sheriff or, a, you know, cop of some sort. And the cop is just like, you know, more interested in why are you here than, hey, somebody's getting the crap beat out of him. Let's stop this. He's like, I don't yeah. care. <laughs> Oh, it's a family dispute. Never mind. <laughs> they go down to the station, and which I thought was a little odd. I mean, but I guess I guess it works. Yeah, but I, I was surprised that Cliff was a cop. I didn't understand why he was telling him, and then it made sense. Oh, that's why he's gone to him. Okay, that makes sense. I didn't realize he was a police officer for ages. I was like, how the hell is he getting like? Oh, I'll just have a look at that file. What? Yeah, it doesn't really click until right then in the in the kitchen scene where he, he tells him he's you know shows yeah. him his. ID or whatever. And yeah. Um, and that was kind of interesting. I do like when they hold stuff back like that. Cause it makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that stuff played out well. And, you know, and then they go to the, the police station and find out there's not a whole lot of information. There's a vague description, um, which if I heard this right, I think the description was a little strange because didn't it say that the person had long hair? Do you recall? I don't recall. I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. I, I could have sworn I heard the cop say that in the description, she described him as having long hair, which I thought was strange because um, he doesn't have long hair. But uh, and then we find out the woman was, you know, hit by a car. Our lead character doesn't really know anything about that stuff because he's gone by that time. I like that the biggest sort of flaw in it was that he can't drive. Which I thought was a great idea. I mean, not that that can't be faked. You know, I mean, I don't think that that's something that would really hold up in court, which is sort of my issue yeah, at the end that, of this movie. That's why Cliff, like, knew 100% that he wasn't lying. And he hadn't right. done it because he knew. Well, at least he knew that he didn't kill the woman, right? Yeah. So he, I think he was at least on his side for one of the killings. But I think everybody's unsure about the original killing. I think that that was a good, interesting plot point. You know, I'm not sure that that would really stand up in court or anybody would seriously take a look at that and consider that a, a an alibi exactly because – I feel like anybody could jump behind a car and drive enough just by seeing how it's done in order to yeah. run somebody over. <laughs> or at least if you're not if you're not good at driving, then you probably would run somebody over. <laughs> so that just makes it more plausible to me than not plausible. <laughs> but I did find that interesting sort of sort of idea. I just don't think the cops would really buy that in the, in the end. I think it was only bought by uh, by him because by Cliff because it was his you know brother in law, um, so it was just giving him the bit of the doubt kind of thing. Also beating the shit out of him for <laughs> potentially doing something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was kind of funny, and we don't get to see the photos uh, in in the movie. But when they shows him the morgue photos and he passes out. And it's just like, man, this guy is messed up, right? <laughs> yeah. It was it reminded me of the Quincy opening, you know, like as they get further and further into it, just more and more of them pass out. <laughs> he was the first right. one to drop, like, we gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I did like the exchange in the kitchen with the the cop, not not Cliff, but the the other cop that shows up, um, where he's like, It's all right. You know, we do this thing for a living, you know, <laughs> the tough guys. It's not for everybody, you know, kind of yeah. thing. This poor young lad, he doesn't know. It's really, it's really funny the the amount of bravado back in the day about, you know, being tough and, and not being tough, that's, that kind of thing. Um, and they really play that up. Wasn't it nice to see a happily married couple for a change? Yeah. I mean, it's it's not often that you get to see that sort of thing. Um, no. Yeah. They were actually it, happy. It, it is. He helped him to look after, like, so his wife wouldn't get upset. But it was like a large portion of him trying to help him. Both couples were happy, you know, um, yeah. which is was nice to see. But unfortunately, because with a movie like this, it doesn't revolve around them. Um, and that's the reason why I think that it's okay in this film for being a noir at that time period that they were able to do that and get away with it because it didn't actually revolve around the women. We had our other semi femme fatale, which would be the woman that gets hit by the car, who's not really in the film at all, other than in the dream, um, who obviously is, you know, cheating on her husband and trying to steal from him kind of thing. Um, 
<clears throat> so we had that other sort of, you know, bad woman aspect, you know, sort of in a, in a B story or, you know, kind of thing. Um, so it worked out nicely. Yeah, that was pretty good. So, hey, Carly, why don't we take a break and listen to an ad from one of our sponsors? We were trying to serve this larger story as we were careening toward the actual millennium. It was bizarre that it didn't get to the actual millennium, but we felt we had to deliver some kind of order, at least avoiding breakdown and chaos. End times, like let's examine that. What is that? What is the human race at the end of its time? Who are we? Those questions don't go out of style. We've been asking them since Greek tragedies first started. We were dealing with human monsters on, on millennium. It was scary, but for the, all the best possible reasons. Frank is a real hero. And he's trying to protect all of us from the darkness that he sees inside of himself. And that paradox and that dichotomy that I think makes the character interesting. There was an integrity in Millennium. And now, 20 years later, we're seeing all the more reason to have integrity. I want to see Frank in our, in our political landscape and how he would be dealing with all the crazy right now. I think Chris has the ability, like Rod Serling, to tap into these deep questions that we all have. I just thought it would be interesting to do a, a tortured FBI agent who saw evil. Chris trying to come up with the darkest, scariest thing that he's really afraid of in real life. And I think we all are. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. I see what the killer see. Millennium really had something powerful to say about the world we live in. Millennium After the Millennium is available now at thetimeisnowmm.com. This is who we are. You're listening to the Speakeasy Noir Cast, the show that brings you bench drinking with a side of noir, with your hosts, Carly Street and Jason D. Morris. I think DeForest Kelly was really the only standout acting, though, in this movie for me. And he seemed to get a bad rep in a lot of reviews. I thought that was really unfair because I thought he was great. I mean, even when I looked at it, I thought, bloody hell, Dr. McCoy here. What, in a bloody, in his first bloody film here? No, oh, God. And he was he was fantastic. He was better than half of yeah. the films that we've seen with, you know, top-notch uh, sort of A-list stars at the time. He was better than some of them, I thought. I totally agree with that, yeah. I, I think that this should have been... I, I wish it had been more critically positive for him it might have changed his career there might have been known for more than just bones i guess but um because i mean in the scheme of things i guess that that's great to have something like star trek and you know to be known for but as far as like career wise i'm sure he aspired to more than just that and the fact that you know the original star trek only ran for like three seasons it wasn't like it was it wasn't a massive hit at the time when it came out only in syndication afterwards did it really believing the fact that he did kill somebody but doesn't pass a thing but um I, th I thought he was he did a great job in this movie he's very sympathetic as a lead character and having this sort of thing happen to him you know then we come around to you know cliff you know believing him more and more but still you know didn't necessarily do it on purpose or of his own free will because he knows this guy. He knows that this just isn't adding up properly, but he can't figure out how. Uh, so they go back to Vince's apartment or, uh, and, and he starts to sort of like, tell me everything, you know, give me the whole story from the top. And I love that line. Tell me like I'm a six year old. <laughs> it's like, okay. Yeah. Um, and starts to talk about the, his neighbor next door and little talks and things like that. And um, this is where my favorite, you know, kind of little piece comes from it where it shows flashbacks of him talking with this this man cliff says oh he's testing your willpower and he finds that interesting because now he's starting to connect to this person and then he tells him about him coming into his room at night and the way he's speaking and how slowly it happens and not necessarily hearing the door click and all these little tiny clues are sort of starting to click for for Cliff. Yeah, I thought, that, I thought the little thing about the door clicking was just fascinating. Yeah, because that actually made me stop and think. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know what? When I showed the flashback, it didn't click. And would you ever have thought anything of that if somebody walked into your room to say night or whatever? You wouldn't be like, oh, the door didn't click. Absolutely not. Shut your eyes and go back to sleep. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. You know, it was very believable that that could happen. And I loved the subtleties of the hypnosis, like not 
it wasn't wasn't overbearing it was very subtle and it was it reminded me a lot of how they kind of do it in uh the mentalist i don't know if you ever watched that show but um simon baker's character in that show uh he does these really subtle sort of hypnosis things. And I'm not sure that any of that really would work in the real world. Cause what I understand you have to like want to be hypnotized in order to be hypnotized. So I'm not sure if those sort of like catch you off guard kind of subtle hypnosis things would actually work in the real world. But it, it I found it interesting how they did it. And it was just with the re- sort of repetitive dialogue or having the flickering of the light of the candle, or later on we see the, the the light reflection of the, of the stopwatch or the the pocket watch and just the way that he talks to him sort of thing and I just find that it's like watching Darren Brown in like the forties <laughs> wandering around just subtly hypnotizing people and making them do murders and stuff <laughs> right <laughs> and yeah I, I think that uh, that was a great angle to take for this movie because it's something different like I don't, I don't know that I recall any other hypnosis noirs but that's something I'm gonna actively look for. Because I, I don't know, I piqued my interest and made it made it extra fun for me. Um, and what I thought about after I finished watching this movie is that, and I believe I sent you this script, but um, I was writing a script called uh, Night Chase, uh, and the lead character's name is Chase, <clears throat> um, and it was it's a film noir set in like the forties, and the whole premise of the story is that our lead character is hypnotized into killing his wife by his psychiatrist. Are you sure you sent that to me? Yeah. I'm not, I mean, it was sort of a minor thing. It was never finished. You know what I mean? And I don't know, maybe I, maybe I might not have, but uh, the, the premise is very similar to this movie uh, in terms of that. But instead of him killing somebody else's, you know, somebody, you know, wants him to kill somebody else. he, ends up killing his own wife. Um, and then the story is him trying to figure out what happened, him being implicated in the murder and trying to figure out, you know, how that ended up happening. This movie really reminded me of that. I thought that was pretty fun because I don't, I don't recall having come across a film noir like that before. Oh. But, you know, it's been done before now, so <laughs> makes makes mine obsolete. <laughs> no, never. Send it out. Find it. Send it over. No, I won't do that. If if we could have a few scenes of somebody crying into a glass over a portrait picture, I mean, we've combined two. (laughs) Love story points (laughs) to one right there. That's funny. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) And I really enjoyed uh, the third act of this movie. I thought it was fun. I I loved the idea that uh, we don't – he doesn't write out explain it, you know, that, oh, you were hypnotized and all this kind of stuff. It's just like, hey, we're going to set this guy up, you know? So it leaves the audience sort of in the dark. It leaves our lead character in the dark and he sort of puts him in a dangerous position uh, to have this happen again to him. And, uh, and that's exactly what happens while they're surveilling, you know, what goes down. Uh, the bad guy hypnotizes him again, gets him out of the house and takes him on a little trip. Yeah. And it's it's funny because the cops don't know that they've left. <laughs> I know. Like, oh, don't worry. We'll be looking after you. It's fine. We just need to see if he can hypnotize you again. And then he hypnotizes him again and takes him. And they're like, oh, where's he gone? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's funny because you see these tropes that, you know, that happen in these older films that, again, are probably like the first time that this has ever happened. But they're so prevalent in today's cinema, you know. <laughs> it's just, I was shouting at the TV. I literally came in. I was like, what's wrong with you? I was like, go get him. Get in the car. He's driven off with him. <laughs> yeah. And they're just like wandering around the house like, oh, not behind this corner. Uh, oh, not in this room. <laughs> I just don't know where they've gone. <laughs> and, and so he drives him down and to the water. And I guess his idea is to drown him or allow himself to allow make him like allow himself to be drowned i guess of his own volition so in a car that he can't drive yeah uh so he gets into the water and i to me it's like i would think that that would wake him up from his hypnosis but i guess not i don't know i don't know anything about it but so he gets in the water and the cops finally show up and you know the guy takes off and the car chases him. He, you know, drives off a cliff and dies. 
and uh, you know our our lead character is saved, and all is right in the world. Um, but then it comes to the problem that I have with the film, which is the very end. They're standing outside the courthouse, and I think it's said a little bit earlier on, but it's said again here, where it's like you have a strong alibi, or you have a strong reasoning, or you've got a, a good case, you know, you're not going to get much trouble. You'll have to answer for what you've done, but it's not your fault kind of thing. And I'm just, how are you going to prove this? The bad guy's dead. You know, you have two cops as sort of witnesses to a second hypnosis where, you know, they were so inept that they did not <laughs> notice that he got him out of the house. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so it's like, where is the, the proof, you know, there's, there's really no proof here. So I, I do not think he's going to get away with this, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, as optimistic as the end of this movie is, I feel like if he goes in there, this man is going to go to jail. <laughs> he's uh, not coming back out. <laughs> yeah. It's just not going to, I just don't think it's going to, it sounds like such a far-fetched idea. And the fact that his, his biggest, you know, I, I guess alibi or, or proof to his innocence is his brother-in-law. So having that sort of connection there isn't going to help his case at all. Well, <laughs> right? maybe his brother-in-law is incredibly well-respected and can pull some strings. Could be, but then again, that also looks bad, you know. So I don't know. Maybe that should be something done behind doors and not necessarily in the court of law <laughs> if that was going to happen. So I don't know. But that was my my only issue that I really had with this movie is trying to – there was no solid proof that they could have to really prove his innocence or that he did not willingly kill somebody. Like I felt like um, – I would have liked to have seen, I don't know what that would have been, but I would like to have seen some sort of like tangible proof that it couldn't have been him or he didn't act alone or acted, uh, you know, under duress or whatever it would be. Um, and and that was something that was just missing for me. How did you feel about the ending? Were you okay with it? Ended on a high. I was I was caught up in it. I was hoping to see them like come back out five minutes later and then be like, we're off to the registry office. Let's get married. <laughs> yeah. So and I would have been actually, I would have been okay with that, not knowing the legality of <laughs> of the situation, because you know that sort of it wouldn't have planted that seed in my head of like that's not going to happen, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it would have just like skipped that. I would have been cool with that, but having them go out of their way to sort of say, hey, you'll 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 probably be fine. You'll get out. You'll get away from this. You know, it's not a big deal. Whatever. Um, in my brain, I'm like, yeah, it's a big deal. He's not getting out of this because there's no I mean, proof. He did, he did kill him. So, right, he did kill him, um, but it wasn't something he would have done had he not have been under hypnosis. So, technically, it's not really his fault. Exactly. You know. You see, but and you're being no, negative. But there's no proof. <laughs> yeah, but maybe, <laughs> maybe they're just going to do a. They just did a big monologue that like uplifted the court, and they got behind him because he's such a nice guy. That they were like, yeah, no worries. You go to the registry office and then my vision could come true because that's when they come out and skip off and go and get married. Live happily ever after. Don't ruin it, Morris. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's rating time. 10 out of 10. Yeah? Yeah, I really, really liked it. It really, really enjoyed it. It was the first one that I watched and I can still, and that was um, a while ago. Yeah. And I, I've watched it three times since because... I actually really, really enjoy watching that film. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm not quite as high with it. I give it a nine because Ooh. I really, really love the plot idea. I really enjoyed DeForest Kelly's acting in this movie. Um, my only hang up is the ending. Is I just wish that there had been some tangible proof to to clear him. That was really my only issue with it. Other than that, I thought it was a fantastic film. I think it starts out so strange and so different than most films. Um, even if this had been a modern film, I think that I would be just as enthralled with it. Uh, I thought it was really fantastic. The whole thing is just such a mystery. Like, what is going on? How did this happen? You know, and I loved that it clicked with me when it clicks with the, with Cliff in the movie. Um when when that happens, that really works well for me. That, that makes it 
you know, cause that's what's supposed to happen. A lot of times you can guess, did you guess that he was hypnotized? No. Uh, you know, early. No. Okay, good. No. That makes me happy. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, Cause I didn't either. I, not, not. Did you think when he found the house with an advert, that was the most genius thing ever? Yeah. I thought all of that was great. That was just genius. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff like that for, for having great writing like that. That's where, that's the reason why the ending for me doesn't work because I just feel like, they either should have just skipped over that whole idea and, like you said, just went and got married um, because we just would assume that there was something to get them off, you know. Yeah. But having to be like, well, go in there. Good luck, buddy. <laughs> <With no proof. laughs> See you never. It's just sort of, yeah, it's just kind of like, oh, shit. Have a happy smile and a happy thought and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. It just that just didn't work for me. But other than that, it was it's really great film. I think I think solid nine out of ten. Um, I would recommend this to anybody. It's a bit tough to find, um, but there is a version of it on Amazon Prime that you can watch, and it is um, a public domain film now, so you can find it on the public domain website as well. Uh, I think we both really enjoyed it, and that's good. We hope you guys at home. Uh, we'll seek it out and watch it as well because it's a really great little film. Um, it's worth it for DeForest Kelly as well. Even if even if you people would probably go, oh, I didn't really like Star Trek. It's nothing to do with that. Just find it if you appreciate good acting. Yeah, and I think there's more people that do like Star Trek than don't. So I think if you're a Star Trek fan, check this movie out. <laughs> they probably are, have already seen it. <laughs> well, they probably already seen it, but you know, either way, check it out. Right. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we hope you enjoyed your hypnotic breeze and uh, chatting with us about uh, Fear in the Night. And until next time. Bye-bye. He's looking at you, kid. Thanks for joining us this week on the Speakeasy Noir Cast. Make sure to visit our website, resurrectionfilms.net, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast apps so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like the show, you might want to check out our book, The Dark Side of Acting Up and The Dark Side of Acting Up Volume 2, now available on Amazon. Or you can check out one of our films, also available on Amazon Prime. Be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Speakeasy Noir Cast.